This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sunshine Sketches of a Little Town by Stephen Leacock. Chapter 4 The Ministrations of the Reverend Mr. Drone. The Church of England in Mariposa is on a side street where the maple trees are thickest, a little up the hill from the heart of the town. The trees above the church and the grass plot that was once the cemetery, till they made the new one, the necropolis, over the brow of the hill, fill out the whole corner. Down behind the church, with only the driving shed and the lane between, is the rectory. It is a little brick house with odd angles. There is a hedge and a little gate and a weeping ash tree with red berries. At the side of the rectory, churchward, is a little grass lawn with low hedges, and at the side of that two wild plum trees that are practically always in white blossom. Underneath them is a rustic table and chairs, and it is here that you may see rural Dean Drone, the incumbent of the Church of England Church, sitting, in the checkered light of the plum trees that is neither sun nor shadow. Generally you'll find him reading, and when I tell you that at the end of the grass plot where the hedge is highest there is a yellow beehive with seven bees that belong to Dean Drone, you will realize that it is only fitting that the dean is reading in the Greek. For what better could a man be reading beneath the blossom of the plum trees, within the very sound of the bees, than the pastorals of Theocritus? The light trash of modern romance might put a man to sleep in such a spot, but with such food for reflection as Theocritus, a man may safely close his eyes and muse on what he reads without fear of dropping into slumber. Some men, I suppose, terminate their education when they leave their college. Not so, Dean Drone. I have often heard him say that if he couldn't take a book in the Greek out on the lawn in a spare half hour, he'd feel lost. It's a certain activity of the brain that must be stilled somehow. The Dean, too, seemed to have a native feeling for the Greek language. I have often heard people who might sit with him on the lawn ask him to translate some of it, but he always refused. One couldn't translate it, he said. It lost so much in the translation that it was better not to try. It was far wiser not to attempt it. If you undertook to translate it, there was something gone, something missing immediately. I believe that many classical scholars feel this way, and like to read the Greek just as it is, without the hazard of trying to put it into so poor a medium as English. So that when Dean Drone said that he simply couldn't translate it, I believe he was perfectly sincere. Sometimes, indeed, he would read it aloud. That was another matter. Whenever, for example, Dr. Gallagher, I mean, of course, old Dr. Gallagher, not the young doctor who was always out in the country in the afternoon, would come over and bring his latest Indian relics to show to the dean, the latter always read to him a passage or two. As soon as the doctor laid his tomahawk on the table, the dean would reach for his Theocritus. I remember that on the day when Dr. Gallagher brought over the Indian skull that they had dug out of the railway embankment and placed it on the rustic table, the dean read to him so long from Theocritus that the doctor, I truly believe, dozed off in his chair. The dean had to wait and fold his hands with the book across his knee, and close his eyes till the doctor should wake up again. And the skull was on the table between them, and from above the plum blossoms fluttered down till they made flakes on it as white as Dr. Gallagher's hair. I don't want you to suppose that the Reverend Mr. Drone spent the whole of his time under the trees, not at all. In point of fact, the rector's life was one round of activity which Lye himself might deplore, but was powerless to prevent. He had hardly sat down beneath the trees of an afternoon after his midday meal, when there was the infant class at three, and after that, with scarcely an hour between, the mother's auxiliary at five, and the next morning the book club, and that evening the Bible study class, and the next morning the early workers' guild at eleven-thirty. The whole week was like that and if one found time to sit down for an hour or so to recuperate, it was the most one could do. After all, if a busy man spends the little bit of leisure that he gets in advanced classical study, there is surely no harm in it. I suppose, take it all in all, there wasn't a busier man than the rural dean among the Anglican clergy of the diocese. If the dean ever did snatch a half-day from his incessant work, he spent it in fishing. But not always that. For as likely as not, instead of taking a real holiday, he would put in the whole afternoon amusing the children and the boys that he knew by making kites and toys and clockwork steamboats for them. 
It was fortunate for the dean that he had the strange interest and aptitude for mechanical advices which he possessed, or otherwise this kind of thing would have been too cruel an imposition. But the Reverend Mr. Drone had a curious liking for machinery. I think I never heard him preach a better sermon than the one on aeroplanes. Lo, what now see you on high Jeremiah too? So it was that he spent two whole days making a kite with Chinese wings for Teddy Moore, the photographer's son, and closed down the infant class for forty-eight hours so that Teddy Moore should not miss the pleasure of flying it, or, rather, seeing it flown. It is foolish to trust a Chinese kite to the hands of a young child. In the same way, the dean made a mechanical top for little Marjorie Trelaney, the cripple, to see spun. It would have been unwise to allow the afflicted girl to spin it. There's no end to the things that Mr. Drone could make, and always for the children. Even when he was making the sand clock for poor little Willie Yodel, who died, you know, the dean went right on with it, and gave it to another child with just the same pleasure. Death, you know, to the clergy is a different thing from what it is to us. The dean and Mr. Gingham used to often speak of it as they walked through the long grass of the new cemetery, the necropolis. And when your Sunday walk is to your wife's grave, as the dean's was, perhaps it seems different to anybody. The Church of England Church, I said, stood close to the rectory, a tall, sweeping church, and inside a great reach of polished cedar beams that ran to the point of the roof. There used to stand on the same spot the little stone church that all the grown-up people in Mariposa still remember, a quaint little building in red and gray stone. About it was the old cemetery, but that was all smoothed out later into the grass plot round the new church, and the headstones laid out flat, and no new graves have been put there for ever so long. But the Mariposa children still walk around and read the headstones lying flat in the grass, and look for the old ones, because some of them are ever so old, forty or fifty years back. Nor are you to think from all this that the dean was not a man with serious perplexities. You could easily convince yourself of the contrary. For if you watch the Reverend Mr. Drone as he sat reading in the Greek, you would notice that no very long period ever passed without his taking up a sheet or two of paper that lay between the leaves of the Theocritus and that were covered close with figures. And these the dean would lay upon the rustic table, and he would add them up forwards and backwards, going first up the column and then down it to see that nothing had been left out, and then down it again to see what it was that must have been left out. Mathematics, you'll understand, were not the dean's forte. They never were the forte of the men who had been trained at the little Anglican College with the clipped hedges and the cricket ground, where Robert Drone had taken the gold medal in Greek fifty-two years ago. You will see the medal at any time lying there in its open box on the rectory table, in case of immediate need. Any of the Drone girls, Lillian, or Jocelyn, or Theodora, would show it to you. But, as I say, mathematics were not the rector's forte, and he blamed for it, in a Christian spirit, you'll understand, the memory of his mathematical professor, and often he spoke with great bitterness. I have often heard him say that in his opinion the colleges ought to dismiss, of course in a Christian spirit, all the professors who are not, in the most reverential sense of the term, fit for their jobs. No doubt many of the clergy of the diocese had suffered more or less just as the dean had from lack of mathematical training, but the dean always felt that his own case was especially to be lamented. For you see, if a man is trying to make a model airplane, for a poor family in the lower part of the town, and he is brought to a stop by the need of reckoning the coefficient of torsion of cast iron rods, it shows plainly enough that the colleges are not truly filling their divine mission. But the figures that I speak of were not those of the model airplane. These were far more serious. Night and day they had been with the rector now for the best part of ten years, and they grew, if anything, more intricate. If, for example, you try to reckon the debt of a church, a large church with a great sweep of polished cedar beams inside, for the special glorification of the all-powerful, and with imported tiles on the roof for the greater glory of heaven, and with stained-glass windows for the exultation of the all-seeing, if, I say, you try to reckon up the debt on such a church and figure out its interest and its present worth, less a fixed annual payment, it makes a pretty complicated sum. Then if you try to add to this the annual cost of insurance, and deduct from it three-quarters of a stipend, year by year, and then suddenly remember that three-quarters is too much, because you have forgotten the boarding-school fees of the littlest of the drones, including French as an extra, she must have it, all the older girls did, 
you've got a sum that pretty well defies ordinary arithmetic. The provoking part of it was that the dean knew perfectly well that with the help of logarithms he could have done the thing in a moment. But at the Anglican College they had stopped short at that very place in the book. They had simply explained that logos was a word and arithmos a number, which at the time seemed amply sufficient. So the dean was perpetually taking out his sheets of figures and adding them upwards and downwards, and they never came the same. Very often Mr. Gingham, who was a warden, would come and sit beside the rector and ponder over the figures, and Mr. Drone would explain that with a book of logarithms you could work it out in a moment. You'd simply open the book and run your finger up the columns, he illustrated exactly the way in which the finger was moved, and there you were. Mr. Gingham said that it was a caution and that logarithms, I quote his exact phrase, must be a terror. Very often, too, Nibbins, the lawyer, who was a sidesman, and Mullins, the manager of the exchange bank, who was the chairman of the vestry, would come and take a look at the figures, but they never could make much of them, because the stipend part was not a matter that one could discuss. Mullins would notice the item for a hundred dollars due on fire insurance, and would say, as a businessman, that surely that couldn't be fire insurance, and the dean would say, surely not, and change it. And Mullins would say surely there couldn't be fifty dollars for taxes, because there weren't any taxes, and the dean would admit that of course it couldn't be for the taxes. In fact, the truth is that the dean's figures were badly mixed, and the fault lay indubitably with the mathematical professor of two generations back. It was always Mullins' intention some day to look into the finances of the church, the more so as his father had been with Dean Drone at the little Anglican college with the cricket ground. But he was a busy man. As he explained to the rector himself, the banking business nowadays is getting to be such that a banker can hardly call even his Sunday mornings his own. Certainly Henry Mullins could not. They belonged largely to Smith's Hotel, and during the fishing season they belonged away down the lake, so far away that practically no one, unless it was George Duff of the commercial bank, could see them. But to think that all this trouble had come through the building of the new church, that was the bitterness of it. For the twenty-five years that rural Dean Drone had preached in the little stone church, it had been his one aim, as he often put it in his sermons, to rear a larger ark in Gideon. His one hope had been to set up a greater evidence, or, very simply stated, to kindle a brighter beacon. After twenty-five years of waiting, he had been able at last to kindle it. Everybody in Mariposa remembers the building of the church. First of all, they had demolished the little stone church to make way for the newer evidence. It seemed almost a sacrilege, as the dean himself said, to lay hands on it. Indeed, it was at first proposed to take the stone of it and build it into a Sunday school, as a lesser testimony. Then, when that provided impracticable, it was suggested that the stone be reverently fashioned into a wall that should stand as a token. And when even that could not be managed, the stone of the little church was laid reverently into a stone pile. Afterwards it was devoutly sold to a building contractor, and, like so much else in life, was forgotten. But the building of the church no one, I think, will forget. The dean threw himself into the work, with his coat off and his white shirt sleeves conspicuous among the gang that were working at the foundations, he set his hand to the shovel, himself guided the road scraper, urging on the horses, cheering and encouraging the men, till they begged him to desist. He mingled with the stonemasons, advising, helping, and giving counsel, till they pleaded with him to rest. He was among the carpenters, sawing, hammering, inquiring, suggesting, till they besought him to lay off. And he was night and day with the architect's assistance, drawing, planning, revising, till the architect told him to cut it out. So great was his activity, that I doubt whether the new church would ever have been finished, had not the wardens and the vestrymen insisted that Mr. Drone must take a holiday, and sent him on the Mackinac trip up the lakes, the only foreign travel of the dean's life. So in due time the new church was built, and it towered above the maple trees of Mariposa like a beacon on a hill. It stood so high that from the open steeple of it, where the bells were, you could see all the town lying at its feet, and the farmsteads to the south of it, and the railway like a double pencil line, and Lake Wissanotti spread out like a map. You could see and appreciate things from the height of the new church, such as the size and the growing wealth of Mariposa, that you never could have seen from the little stone church at all. Presently the church was opened, and the dean preached his first sermon in it, and he called it a greater testimony, 
and he said that it was an earnest or first fruit of endeavor, and that it was a token or pledge, and he named it also a covenant. He said, too, that it was an anchorage and a harbor and a lighthouse, as well as being a city set upon a hill, and he ended by declaring it an ark of refuge, and notified them that the Bible class would meet in the basement of it on that and every other third Wednesday. In the opening months of preaching about it, the dean had called the church so often an earnest and a pledge and a guerdon and a tabernacle that I think he used to forget that it wasn't paid for. It was only when the agent of the building society and a representative of the Hosanna Pipe and Steam Organ Company, Limited, used to call for quarterly payments that he was suddenly reminded of the fact. Always after these men came round, the dean used to preach a special sermon on sin, in the course of which he would mention that the ancient Hebrews used to put unjust traitors to death, a thing of which he spoke with Christian serenity. I don't think that at first anybody troubled much about the debt on the church. Dean Drone's figures showed that it was only a matter of time before it would be extinguished. Only a little effort was needed, a little girding up of the loins of the congregation, and they could shoulder the whole debt and trample it under their feet. Let them but set their hands to the plough, and they could soon guide it into the deep water. Then they might furl their sails and sit every man under his own olive tree. Meantime, while the congregation was waiting to gird up its loins, the interest on the debt was paid somehow, or, when it wasn't paid, was added to the principal. I don't know whether you have had any experience with greater testimonies and with beacons set on hills. If you have, you will realize how, at first gradually, and then rapidly, their position from year to year grows more distressing. What with the building loan and the organ installment, and the fire insurance, a cruel charge, and the heat and light, the rector began to realize, as he added up the figures, that nothing but logarithms could solve them. Then the time came when not only the rector, but all the wardens knew, and the sidesmen knew that the debt was more than the church could carry. Then the choir knew, and the congregation knew, and at last everybody knew. And there were special collections at Easter, and special days of giving, and special weeks of tribulation, and special arrangements with the Hosanna Pipe and Steam Organ Company, and it was noticed that when the rural dean announced a service of Lenten sorrow, aimed more especially at the businessmen, the congregation had diminished by forty per cent. I suppose things are just the same elsewhere. I mean the peculiar kind of discontent that crept into the Church of England congregation in Mariposa after the setting up of the beacon. There were those who claimed that they had seen the error from the first, though they had kept quiet, as such people always do, from breadth of mind. There were those who had felt years before how it would end, but their lips were sealed from humility of spirit. What was worse was that there were others who grew dissatisfied with the whole conduct of the church. Yodel, the auctioneer, for example, narrated how he had been to the city and had gone into a service of the Roman Catholic Church. I believe, to state it more fairly, he had dropped in, the only recognized means of access to such a service. He claimed that the music that he had heard there was music, and that, outside of his profession, the chanting and intoning could not be touched. Ed Moore, the photographer, also related that he had listened to a sermon in the city, and that if anyone would guarantee him a sermon like that, he would defy you to keep him away from church. Meanwhile, failing the guarantee, he stayed away. The very doctrines were impeached. Some of the congregation began to cast doubts on eternal punishment doubt so grave as to keep them absent from the Lenten services of sorrow. Indeed, lawyer McCartney took up the whole question of the Athanasian Creed one afternoon with Joe Milligan, the dentist, and hardly left a clause of it intact. All this time, you'll understand, Dean Drone kept on with his special services, and leaflets, calls, and appeals went out from the Ark of Gideon like rockets from a sinking ship. More and more with every month, the debt of the church lay heavy on his mind. At times he forgot it. At other times he woke up in the night and thought about it. Sometimes, as he went down the street from the lighted precincts of the Greater Testimony and past the Salvation Army, praying around a nap the lamp under the open sky, it smote him to the heart with a stab. But the congregation were wrong, I think, in inputting fault to the sermons of Dean Drone. There I do think they were wrong. 
I can speak from personal knowledge when I say that the rector's sermons were not only stimulating in matters of faith, but contained valuable material in regards to the Greek language, to modern machinery, and to a variety of things that should have proved of the highest advantage to the congregation. There was, I say, the Greek language. The dean always showed the greatest delicacy of feeling in regard to any translation in or out of it that he made from the pulpit. He was never willing to accept even the faintest shade of rendering different from that commonly given without being assured of the full concurrence of the congregation. Either the translation must be unanimous and without contradiction, or he could not pass it. He would pause in his sermon and would say, The original Greek is hosen, but perhaps you will allow me to translate it as equivalent to hoyen. And they did. So that if there was any fault to be found, it was purely on the side of the congregation for not entering a protest at the time. It was the same way in regard to machinery. After all, what better illustrates the supreme purpose of the all-wise than such a thing as the dynamo, or the reciprocating marine engine, or the pictures in the Scientific American? Then, too, if a man has had the opportunity to travel, and has seen the great lakes spread out by the hand of Providence, from where one leaves the dock at the sound, to where one arrives safe and thankful with one's dear fellow passengers, in the spirit, at the concrete landing stage at Mackinaw, is not this fit and proper material for the construction of an analogy or illustration? Indeed, even apart from an analogy, is it not mighty interesting to narrate anyway? In any case, why should the church wardens have sent the rector on the Mackinaw trip if they had not expected him to make some little return for it? I lay some stress on this point, because the criticisms directed against the Mackinaw sermons always seemed so unfair. If the rector had described his experiences in the crude language of the ordinary newspaper, there might, I admit, have been something unfitting about it. But he was always careful to express himself in a way that showed... or... listen... Let me explain with an example. It happened to be my lot some years ago, he would say, to find myself a voyager, just as one is a voyager on the sea of life, on the broad expanse of water which has been spread out to the northwest of us by the hand of Providence, at a height of 581 feet above the level of the sea. I refer, I may say, to Lake Huron. Now, how different that is from saying, I'll never forget the time I went on the Mackinac trip. The whole thing has a different sound entirely. In the same way, the dean would go on. I was voyaging on one of those magnificent leviathans of the water. I refer to the boats of the Northern Navigation Company, and was standing beside the forward rail, talking with a dear brother in the faith, who was journeying westward also. I may say he was a commercial traveller. And beside us was a dear sister in the spirit, seated in a deck-chair, while near us were two other dear souls in grace engaged in Christian pastime on the deck. I allude more particularly to the game of deck-billiards. I leave it to any reasonable man whether, with that complete and fair-minded explanation of the environment, it was not perfectly proper to close down the analogy, as the rector did, with the simple words, in fact, it was an extremely fine morning. Yet there were some people, even in Mariposa, that took exception, and spent their Sunday dinner-time in making out that they couldn't understand what Dean Drone was talking about, and asking one another if they knew. Once, as he passed out from the doors of the greater testimony, the rector heard someone say, The church would be all right if that old mugwump was out of the pulpit. It went to his heart like a barbed thorn, and stayed there. You know, perhaps, how a remark of that sort can stay and rankle, and make you wish you could hear it again to make sure of it, because perhaps you didn't hear it aright, and it was a mistake after all? Perhaps no one said it anyway. You ought to have written it down at the time. I have seen the dean take down the encyclopedia in the rectory, and move his fingers slowly down the pages of the letter M, looking for Mugwump, but it wasn't there. I have known him, in his little study upstairs, turn over the pages of The Animals of Palestine, looking for a Mugwump, but there was none there. It must have been unknown in the greater days of Judea. So things went on from month to month, and from year to year, and the debt and the charges loomed like a dark and gathering cloud on the horizon. I don't mean to say that efforts were not made to face the difficulty and to fight it. They were. Time after time the workers of the congregation got together and thought out plans for the extinction of the debt. But somehow, after every trial, the debt grew larger with each year, and every system that could be devised turned out more hopeless than the last. 
They began, I think, with the endless chain of letters of appeal. You may remember the device, for it was all popular in clerical circles some ten or fifteen years ago. You got a number of people to write each of them three letters asking for ten cents from three each of their friends, and asking each of them to send on three similar letters. Three each from three each, and three each more from each. Do you observe the wonderful ingenuity of it? Nobody, I think, has forgotten how the willing workers of the Church of England Church of Mariposa sat down in the vestry room in the basement with a pile of stationery three feet high, sending out the letters. Some, I know, will never forget it. Certainly not Mr. Pupkin, the teller in the exchange bank, for it was here that he met Zena Pefferley, the judge's daughter, for the first time. And they worked so busily that they wrote out ever so many letters, eight or nine, in a single afternoon, and they discovered that their handwritings were awfully alike, which is one of the most extraordinary and amazing coincidences, you must admit, in the history of chirography. But the scheme failed, failed utterly. I don't know why. The letters went out and were copied, broadcast, and recopied, till you could see the Mariposa endless chain winding its way towards the Rocky Mountains. But they never got the ten cents. The willing workers wrote for it in thousands, but by some odd chance they never struck the person who had it. Then after that there came a regular winter of effort. First of all, they had a bazaar that was got up by the girls' auxiliary and held in the basement of the church. All the girls wore special costumes that were brought up from the city, and they had booths where there was every imaginable thing for sale. Pincushion covers, and chair covers, and sofa covers, everything that you could think of. If the people had once started buying them, the debt would have been lifted in no time. Even as it was, the bazaar only lost twenty dollars. After that, I think, was the Magic Lantern lecture that Dean Drone gave on Italy and her invaders. They got the lantern and the slides up from the city, and it was simply splendid. Some of the slides were perhaps a little confusing, but it was all there. The pictures of the dense Italian jungle, and the crocodiles, and the naked invaders with their invading clubs. It was a pity that it was such a bad night, snowing hard and a curling match on, or they would have made a lot of money out of the lecture. As it was, the loss, apart from the breaking of the lantern, which was unavoidable, was quite trifling. I can hardly remember all the things that there were after that. I recollect that it was always Mullins who arranged about renting the hall and printing the tickets and all that sort of thing. His father, you remember, had been at the Anglican College with Dean Drone, and though the rector was thirty-seven years older than Mullins, he leaned upon him in matters of business as upon a staff and though Mullins was thirty-seven years younger than the dean, he leaned against him in matters of doctrine as against a rock. At one time they got the idea that what the public wanted was not anything instructive, but something light and amusing. Mullins said that people loved to laugh. He said that if you can get a lot of people all together and get them laughing, you can do anything you like with them. Once they start to laugh, they are lost. So they got Mr. Dreary, the English literature teacher at the high school, to give an evening of readings from the great humorists, from Chaucer to Adam Smith. They came mighty near to making a barrel of money out of that. If the people had once started laughing, it would have been all over with them. As it was, I heard a lot of them say that they just simply wanted to scream with laughter. They said they just felt like bursting into peals of laughter all the time. Even when, in the more subtle parts, they didn't feel like bursting out laughing, they said they had all they could do to keep from smiling. They said they never had such a hard struggle in their lives not to smile. In fact, the chairman said, when he put the vote of thanks, that he was sure if people had known what the lecture was to be like, there would have been a much better turnout. But, you see, all that the people had to go on was just the announcement of the name of the lecturer, Mr. Dreary, and that he would lecture on English humor, all seats twenty-five cents. As the chairman expressed it himself, if the people had had any idea, any idea at all, of what the lecture would be like, they would have been there in hundreds. But how could they get an idea that it would be so amusing, with practically nothing, to go upon? After that attempt, things seemed to go from bad to worse. Nearly everybody was disheartened about it. What would have happened to the debt, or whether they would have ever paid it off, is more than I can say, if it hadn't occurred that light broke in on Mullins in that strangest and most surprising way you can imagine. It happened that he went away for his bank holidays, and while he was away, he happened to be present 
in one of the big cities, and saw how they went at it there to raise money. He came home in such a state of excitement that he went straight up from the Mariposa station to the rectory, the Lees and all, and he burst in one April evening to where the rural dean was sitting with the three girls beside the lamp in the front room, and he cried out, Mr. Drone, I've got it. I've got a way that will clear the debt before you're a fortnight older. We'll have a whirlwind campaign in Mariposa. But stay. The change from the depth of depression to the pinnacle of hope is too abrupt. I must pause and tell you in another chapter of The Whirlwind Campaign in Mariposa. End of chapter 4